Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is the first webinar on the information protocol, which we'll hear more about shortly. So let me just see if I can get this working properly. Yep. So the agenda. So I, I will give you an update, a quick update on the Alliance. Uh, wearing my UK BIM Alliance London hat today. Um, Sean sends his apologies. Sean would normally be doing this as chair of the London region, um, but he's had to drop out, so I'm covering for Sean today. Uh, following me, Andy's going to introduce and talk a little bit about the UK BIM framework. And then we have the main part of the webinar is around the information protocol. And we have the authors, May, Andrew and Simon, who will be presenting on the protocol. Now, this is a go to webinar program uh, yeah, session and you will have heard the lady just say that you are in listen only mode and you will be in listen only mode. To ask a question, you can see that there is a questions tab. Please use that questions tab to ask a question and we will answer it at the end of the after the presentations as part of the panel Q&A. Avoid using the raise hand option unless you're asked a specific question and asked to raise your hand. We are recording this session and we will make it available to view via the UK BIM Alliance YouTube channel just as soon as we can. Um, so yeah, just the way the webinar is going to work. I have a distinct feeling we will have a lot of questions and if we don't get to answer your question as part of the webinar, and um, we will take all the questions offline, answer them and share them all via the uh, web page as well. So that's more to come. So a little bit of an update from a UK BIM Alliance London point of view. So previously we've been called BIM Regions London, uh, along with a number of other regions across the country. We have had a rebrand and are now known as the UK BIM Alliance London group. And this is to, to make uh, the connection with the UK BIM Alliance a lot more visible and to show that we are all aligned. Um, you will notice that I've put a little note on the bottom there. Um, we are looking for active members to become part of the leadership team within the UK BIM Alliance London group. At the moment, there is Sean and myself and we need more help and support. So if you feel like you can get involved uh, in putting on events uh, and supporting the, the, the admin side of UK BIM Alliance London, then please do get in touch using that email address there and we'll take it from there. So UK BIM Alliance London Group is part of the communities group, uh, which, like I say, is a regional group. Uh, and there's a number of regional groups across the country, which you can see on the right hand side of this uh, slide here. Uh, the London group sits amongst the South East and you will see there are Midlands groups, Wales groups, Scotland groups, as well as Northern Ireland. And in Ireland itself, we have a partnership with CETA where we have the, BIM, uh, the UK BIM Alliance regional groups as well. The other element of communities are the BIM4 groups. Now, these are special interest groups and you can see a list of them on the left hand side. The aim of the UK BIMA communities is to bring together the BIM4 groups and the regional groups so that everybody's working together, sharing best practice and delivering a consistent aligned message. So you will hear a lot more about the UK BIMA communities as we progress through the year, but this is just a highlight for you from this point onwards. Just a couple of things I want to make you aware of um, from a, an industry noise point, news point of view. If you sign up to the UK BIM Alliance newsletter, you will already have this information. But what I would like to make you aware of is there is a ISO 19650 part five launch webinar taking place on the 9th of July at 10 o'clock. It's been hosted by BSI, British Standards Institute. Um, there is a link here which you will you, you will get copies of the slides um, to register for that. Recently, CDBB, or the Centre for Digital Built Britain's National Din Twin Programme, launched an open consultation seeking feedback on the proposed approach for developing an information management framework for the built environment. 
that is currently open and again there's a link there to download and read and feedback on that. Something slightly different, uh, our colleagues at Class of Your Own um, have created a design challenge. So it's open to all primary and secondary schools and it's about creating an inclusive learning space uh, to promote greener style of living. Challenge is open now and it closes on the 31st of August. So as part of the curriculum uh, and especially because we're all tending to a lot of schools aren't open and a lot of the kids are working from home you can also get involved individually as well so that's something to look out for um, 10 things you need to know about the alliance this may be a slide you've seen before but the alliance is all about you you are the alliance that's what we're here for projects such as the guidance work which Andy will touch on as part of his presentation, are managed and run within the exec team. We're not a closed door. We are an open group. Anyone can be part of it. Um, we are not funded by government, but we're funded by strategic partners and patrons. Our remit is to promote BIM business as usual. There's a regional hub near you. So UK BIMA London is your regional hub if you're based in London, but as the previous map showed you, we do have them across the country and into Ireland. And again, there's a BIM4 group, hopefully specifically to you and your, your interests as well. We have a number of ambassadors who go out uh, and present and promote the work of the Alliance. Um, and again, you will see these people at events uh, physically, once physical events are back on the calendar but also virtually as well. Uh, in fact, one of our ambassadors is presenting today. May Winfield is an ambassador for the UK BIM Alliance. Um, the whole point of the Alliance is to connect with others. A lot more difficult, I agree, at the moment with it all being virtually. Um, but once we are back together and having live events, we should be more able to connect with each other as well. And finally, it's for you to use anything that is published under the UK BIM Alliance, but also for you to get involved in creating projects as well. So there's lots of information there, but these are the 10 main things you need to know about the Alliance. Um, so yes, that's there. And please do get in touch with us. At the end of the, the whole presentations, you will see a slide in the different ways that you can get involved. So as mentioned, uh, BIM4 groups, uh, they, they are specific BIM4 groups and tonight, tonight's presentation is brought to you by the BIM4 Legal Group in partnership with the UK BIM Alliance London Group. So there we have both the regional group and a BIM4 group working together to deliver this. They're going to talk about the information protocol, uh, which is supporting BSEN ISO 19650. Um, with that, what I would like to do is introduce the next presenter, um, who is Andy Bootle, who will talk to you about the UK BIM framework. So with that, I'm just handing over the slides to Andy now. Thank you, Pam. Can you hear me okay and see my screen? I can, but your screen is... There you go, perfect. Yeah. Wonderful, thanks. Um, and good evening, everyone. We've just, I'm just keeping my eyes on the attendee list. We've just tipped the 200 mark. So thanks so much for joining us this evening. Hope it's an informative one for you. So I'm just going to do quite a quick introduction and overview to the UK BIM framework, which really sets the scene for our main topic tonight, as Pam mentioned, which is uh, about the information protocol from the authors. So UK BIM Framework, um, it's, a, it's a partnership and being developed by the three organisations you can see on the screen, so British Standards Institute, Centre for Digital Built Britain and the UK BIM Alliance. Uh, what is it? Well, it's the place to go for the standards, guidance and soon resources um, for implementing BIM in the UK. Um, and I suppose why, why, why a framework approach is that there's a number of reasons in there. Um, so this really sort of signals the BIM level two pieces, uh, it, we, we look back and reflect and think, you know, that was great work done under BIM level two and it, it really did help drive everything. But there were, there were a number of uh, 
things where it started to become a little bit counterproductive. Um, so there, there were lots of debates um, around the community of actually what comprised a BIM level two, because there are obviously a number of standards being released under the 1192 suite. You know, what, what does that actually mean? It couldn't be accurately legally defined, and, and I'm sure our, um, our presenters later will happily fill any questions on that. But so at, when we started to see a lot of lazy procurement, quite honestly, can, can, can I have BIM level two, please, supply chain, which was really going against the whole purpose of it. So it was decided a framework approach would be more appropriate, which does then allow, as we know, the stat, you know, the, the uh, the, the industry is maturing. We've got ongoing standards being released, um, specifically in the 9650 series, that is starting to replace its 1192 equivalents. So that that's kind of the why and what. Um, and just an important note: to, you know, BIM Level Two effectively has morphed into a framework approach. Why is that not moved on? Bear with me. There we go. So effectively, this is the overarching approach to implementing BIM in the UK. So this is a, an image from the website, which I'll touch on shortly, and and it's a, it's a little bit interactive. Um, again, it's important to reiterate here that BIM's always been about design, build, and operate. So it is as much about the operational phase as the design and build, uh, despite the focus probably being by industry more on the design and build um, phases to date. So that those when you click on those images on the website, they'll they'll have the appropriate standards, guidance, etc., under those various segments. Um, again, I don't think I really need to talk on that too much. I think the point that Pam mentioned, there's an information management framework being proposed and developed. Um, and one of the first questions I had in my head is, well, how does so we're going to have a BIM framework and a information management framework? And certainly the two are designed to they're going to work together absolutely and um, with mark ends has backed that and i think the integrate piece we're looking at on the screen there is is the connection into whatever this information management framework um, looks like when that's been developed so it is very much a coordinated hopefully a slick approach so this is a, again a, an image from the website in terms of the standards and guidance that's available. So on the left we can see uh, obviously the part one and part two of ISO 9650 and, and, the, and the transition guide are currently live. Click on that, it will take you to the BSI portal to be able to buy those standards. There may be different um, options for you if you needed to do that. Unfortunately I, ISO standards aren't free. Uh, the 1192 standards under that, uh, UK government paid for. So you, you know, if you haven't already got those, or you, you do decide you want to download, there, there is a free option to download load those. Um, Pam did mention we've got part five and part three. Um, they'll be superseded later this year when the equivalent 19650 standards come out and replace them. Um, and I think there'll probably be some more surrounding link standards that appear on here over time. Um, as a number of you will be aware, it's it's you know, standards relate to other standards, so the list goes on, um, but there may be some other more appropriate standards that, that also add to that list. Um, and then over here, the guidance. Um, so the guidance part one's there. Part two, which is the one that's been worked on quite heavy at the moment, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that shortly, briefly. Transition guidance, which again is available there. Government soft landings guidance, and more recently and appropriate to this uh, session, the information protocol is now there for you to view and download okay so in terms of the guidance to part two iso 9650 part two we're currently on edition four over here and um, that's 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 live so these this is the main content that's being added as we go across these editions so edition four saw uh, a bit more detail from emma hooper on exchange information requirements open uh, a piece on open data and building smart uh, John Ford uh, also produced some information delivery planning guidance and Mark Sia uh, started to talk about leveling of information need as a, as a, again as a framework approach to specifying information requirements. Um, edition 5, which we are on track with for the end of July, um, all being well for publishing, that's going to have a piece on the information management function and responsibility matrices and again some actual examples of what good EIRs may look like and contain. So that's, uh, do keep an eye out for that. And there's some, some quite good stuff uh, in the pipeline that's help, helping to build the guidance. 
So I'm nearly done now. Uh, and this was, again, this is on the website and it was just a message just to reinforce that, you know, this is a coordinated approach um, to try and help integration uh, or implementation of BIM in the UK. And the most important thing for me is this bottom piece of the statement. Uh, you know, we, we are working as an industry to help for, hopefully provide a single set of clear guidance. You know, we don't want multiple different parties creating different guidance that contradicts. Let's all lean into one industry uh, produced piece of guidance. So please do feedback and get involved like many of you already are. So as I mentioned, it is available and this is available on the website. There's the website address at the top. Um, if you have any feedback, questions, comments, uh, there's an email address there, info at ukbimframework.org. And if you follow on Twitter, you can obviously see any updates that are posted and shared there. So that is my piece done. That's a whistle stop tour. And I will now hand over to May, who's going to start talking about the protocol itself. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andy. Uh, let me just. Hopefully that works. Uh, Pam, I assume the correct view can be seen. Um, great. Uh, so. As all of you will know, you're here to hear about the new information protocol, uh, which we wrote and was released recently. Um, bit about me, uh, my name is Mae Winfield. I'm an Associate Director at Borough Happold Engineering. I have been involved in the legal side of BIM for some years. Uh, I was committee member of the ISO transition guidance and I've also been involved in the writing of the guidance, the legal section of that, as well as the JCT practice note on BIM, which is ISA compliant, uh, as well as various, various other reports and documentation. Um, I have, uh, I'm also chair of BIM for Legal, which is uh, co-hosting this event. And as if I would encourage all of you to get your legal advisors involved in our group. And um... Hi everybody, um, I'm Andrew Croft. Um, I'm a senior associate in the projects and contracts advisory team at Beal & Company. Um, I'm a BIM for Legal committee member and advise, have been advising on the legal implications of BIM since 2011 when I was involved in advising on the legal implications of the government construction strategy. Um, I was involved in drafting the CIC protocols versions one and two um, and was also one of the co-authors of the JCT BIM practice note um, May mentioned um, and have advised on the on contractual arrangements in relation to BIM um, on a number of key projects worldwide including for example like HS2 and Crossrail. Hi everybody, I'm uh, Simon Lewis. Um, I'm the um, a partner in and head of disputes in the construction and engineering team at uh, Womble Bond Dickinson. Uh, I'm the vice chair of BIM for Legal. Uh, I'm also obviously one of the co-authors of the information protocol uh, and I was on the uh, working group for PAS 11925. I see I've forgotten to mention that I was also involved in drafting the legal aspects of the guidance uh, along with Andrew and May. Um, and being uh, older than the other two, thought I might as well put in my 30 years of experience uh, in dispute resolution in the construction sector, which is the uh, the other thing that I do apart from my uh, abiding interest in BIM and all things digital over the years. Thanks. Back to you, May. Thanks, Simon. Um, so uh, this is a bit of a labour of love. This we have been drafting this for probably about a year. Uh, it uh, why did it take so long? Well, it did require, obviously, a close analysis of the ISO speaking to the people who wrote it. We're very grateful for all the support we got from the CIC and the UK BIM framework to enable it to be published. Once the draft was in pretty much final form, what we did do is give it to the um, ISO guidance working group to ensure it was understandable and work from a 
industry perspective, not just from a legal perspective. So it was reviewed by people like Dan Rossiter, John Ford, Anne Kemp, David Church, who obviously wrote the ISO in 19650 part one. Uh, and, and then it, we incorporated their comments and finally it was ready. And when we were told it would be um, issued, this was kind of our reaction, but then we realized the even harder task begins, which is in making sure it's implemented, making sure people understand it, it's um, that it works. But um, most importantly is the implementation. The One of the problems with the CIC BIM protocol, whilst a great document, is it just wasn't widely used, which meant that there wasn't a standardized process, there wasn't um, standardized contract terms leading to misunderstandings, gaps uh, and disputes. We're looking to change that. One thing important to remember is that the guidance we wrote in part one, which you can find on the UK BIM Alliance website, remains relevant and it's helpful to read that because it informs the approach and the ethos behind the protocol uh, and also enables say uh, lawyers who aren't very familiar with BIM processes why certain things were included and from a from a legal perspective and risk management perspective. Now the protocol was a new protocol was required not just because um, the ISO isn't like for like with PAS 1192 it does introduce new tasks, new obligations, but the way it envisages the contract document structured is slightly different in a very important aspect. Now, this is a flowchart I uh, drafted with Paul Shilcock, who obviously wrote the ISO 19650 part two to try and illustrate that. And you'll see there that the protocols envisaged to be part of the contract, no surprise there, but there are additional documentation such as the information standard, uh, the BEP is now contract document, but there's also all those blue boxes of information and documents and data which are intended to be referred to or incorporated into the contractual obligations. And we took this into account in uh, drafting the protocol to ensure that parties were able to comply without having to go through the uh, ISO with a fine tooth comb. Uh, just point to note that the lead appointed party appointment uh, contractual documentation is slightly different from the appointed party because there's the TIDP and the detailed responsibility matrix. And you will notice when you go through the protocol, this is reflected in the different parties' obligations. Now, one of uh, the other things we wanted to do is take this opportunity to apply lessons learned uh, from the use of the CIC BIM protocol, both our own personal experience and the experience we heard from the industry. So one of the things which ha has been um, very apparent is that often the protocols attached to a contract without the schedules being filled in, they're just blank, or it's referred to as if it's a standard rather than attached. Both of these things have fundamental problems with the validity and enforceability of the protocol. So to fix that, we've got rid of the schedules. We've made it as easy as possible for lawyers and people putting together the contracts to include it in without necessarily understanding the technical side of BIM. So there's just one page, front page, can't miss it of all the important documents which are required to comply with the ISO or to um, assist the interpretation within the protocol. We've also um, changed or clarified the order of president's clause within the protocol, which um, had some confusion and concern uh, as regards the CIC pro protocol version. Uh, we also have various definitions which Andrew will touch on, which incorporate the ISO definitions but may uh, clarify them from a legal perspective, again adding that legal certainty and everything being in one place. In effect, trying to simplify the search for what um, things mean, where the documents, who does what, when and how. 
there is one now one protocol for all contracts so you don't have to take the protocol and try to amend it for um, your supply chain again this will avoid what happens now which is various gaps and discrepancies when you look through the different contractual documents as I mentioned there is the information particulars which enables there being one list of documents obviously if there's a particular document that simply isn't relevant to your project then you put not applicable none it's just this is the complete list one um, other point is that there is the phrase obviously introduced by the ISO 19650 which is BIM according to ISO 19650 or being updated it would be BIM according to the UK BIM framework and we've all seen this starting to appear in tenders now anyone who's seen me speak since the ISO was released knows that my view of the expression is that it's clear as mud now we want to avoid another level two gate so we sat down and worked out how can we um, avoid people getting confused can we help provide a definition that is sufficiently flexible you'll find in the protocol what we have said is where your contract send at EIR or elsewhere says you will um, deliver BIM according to the UK BIM framework that means that simply means compliance with this protocol we've now provided you a definition and we hope it will now be crystal clear Thank you, Hey. So I'm now going to look at one of the key parts of the terminology, or one of the key parts of the protocol um, in terms of how it functions, and, and that is the, the role of terminology. As with any contractual or legal document, um, definitions in the protocol um, are a really important part of how the protocol actually works and operates and definitions do really need to be understood in order to properly follow through how the protocol operates. The definitions we've included in, in the protocol are set out in clause 13 and they are generally consistent with the terms used in ISO 19650 and because of that the terminology has changed from that used in the CIC protocol second edition for example, the reference to employees' information requirements now, now refers to the exchange information requirements. And instead of level of definition, the new protocol refers to the level of information need. An important point is that the definitions in the information protocol, they only apply for the purpose of the information protocol. They're not intended to override the definitions that are in the ISO. They're just definitions that apply for the purpose of that contract. To create further consistency, the information protocol does use the precise ISO definitions in a few areas. And to do that, it indicates that the relevant term is defined by referring to it in italics. They include the terms the appointed party and the appointing party and the common data environment. And they were terms where we thought there was no point um, trying to change what's, it, what's in the ISO. We just wanted to follow the key approach in the ISO itself. So who are the key parties in the information protocol? Essentially, there are two parties referred to in the protocol that, that enter into the underlying appointment. They are the appointee, which is the party appointed under the appointment, and the appointer, which is the party appointing the appointee. And it's not easy to say that after you've had a few whiskies, but um, that that they are the key point or the key parties in the information protocol. Two other key roles in the information protocol which 
derived from ISO 19650 are that of the appointing party and the lead appointed party. The appointing party, as those that are familiar with ISO 19650 will know, is essentially what we would call the employer or the client, who is ultimately appointing the top tier of the supply chain. And the lead appointed party is essentially that top tier, i.e. a tier one contractor or consultant, who is essentially leading a delivery team in terms of the ISO processes. Those terms are defined and they're important because there are certain parts of the protocol that only apply if the appointing party is one of the parties or if the lead appointed party is one of the parties. And that approach has been taken to, to make the protocol as flexible as possible so that it could be used in various different parts of the supply chain and the relevant obligations will just automatically switch on and off. Another important point in terms of term terminology is that obviously the key, the key documents and processes that are referred to under ISO 19650 are also defined in the information protocol. And those definitions are flexible. So they don't mean that just because you refer to one of the documents in the information protocol, that that is fixed throughout the contract. The definition referred to that, that document as may be updated from time to time in accordance with the ISO, for example. And that allows the parties' requirements under those documents to change during the project, as may be provided in the ISO. A final key point in terms of the definitions is that the information protocol uses the term required standard and essentially says that both parties' obligations under the protocol are only to exercise the required standard. The required standard essentially means the skill and care required under the appointment. And that approach has been taken to create consistency with the underlying appointment and also to create consistency with typical insurance arrangement and in particular professional indemnity insurance arrangements. Another key element of the protocol in terms of the obligations is the approach to coordination. Under ISO 19650, there will be a significant amount of information exchanged. And it's obviously important that that information is as coordinated as possible. Clause three of the information protocol, therefore, includes a similar process to that which was included in the um, previous CIC protocol, um, encouraging, firstly, that coordination meetings occur as may be stated in the information particulars and the underlying appointment, and also a process for trying to resolve any conflict or omission in any information should that arise during the course of the project. So that applies both to any conflicts in or between information and any conflict or omission in the information particulars itself. So it's a process that can be used to try and help address issues there might be with any of those processes or documents or resources referred to in the information particulars. Essentially, the processes firstly follow what the appointment says to do. But if there is nothing in the appointment to notify what the issue is and then try and resolve it and if necessary, have a meeting with the relevant people. So what are the appointing parties key obligations under the information protocol? Remember, this is the appointing party I'm talking about here. 
So i.e. that the employer uh, or client If the appointing party is a party to the underlying appointment, the protocol requires them to arrange for the information particulars to be reviewed and updated from time to time until completion of the project or, 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 the, or the necessary project. And also to arrange for the appointment of individuals to undertake the appointing party's key information management tasks. It's important to note that the obligation to arrange for these things to happen doesn't mean the appointing party has to do everything themselves and suddenly has significantly wider obligations. It means they need to put processes in place so that this does happen during the, during the project. I mentioned previously that the appointing party is required to review and update the information particulars as required and similar to the CIC protocol approach. If the information particulars are updated during the project, the appointee's rights as a result of that update will be assessed as set out in the appointment. And that's important because any change in the information particulars may either change the scope of the appointee or just change their approach to information management during the project. So this might be repeated again in some of the other slides, but it is always important to consider the information protocol alongside the underlying appointment and to put those provisions in the underlying appointment setting out how any change to information particulars will be addressed as necessary. The information pr protocol also essentially removes the, the roles of information manager and a built asset security manager which were set out in the second edition of the CIC protocol and simply includes a more general requirement for individuals to be appointed by the appointing party um, to assist those information management processes and that would also include security. This is intended to be a more flexible approach and to avoid necessarily having to have an additional team member um, just to carry out the information management role for example. Clause four then sets out some more general obligations that apply to both parties under the protocol. Essentially, it helps embed some of the key ISO 19650 processes contractually. The first way it does that is by requiring both parties to comply with the information particulars insofar as they are applicable to them. And it's important to note that the way information particulars is defined, that means not only comply with the cover sheet of the protocol, but also comply with the documents, processes and resources that are identified in that cover sheet. So that obligation really does embody or embed all those processes into the contract. There are also some obligations to comply with some of the key processes in ISO 19650 in particular. That includes um, an obligation on the appointee to test the methods and procedures required in the information particulars, an obligation on the lead appointed, lead appointing party to establish the risk register. And that's important that that's a contractual obligation because the risk register could ultimately have some legal consequences and or could help mitigate any risks arising later in the project. So it's important that that is reflected in the protocol. In addition, the 
point but both parties agreed to use the common data environment solution and workflow to essentially share information during the project and we'll come on to that later in the webinar and they also agree that they'll share information at the time stated in the information particulars subject to any extension of time they might be entitled to under the appointment again this is where i repeat what i just said just now that it really is important to consider how the appointment to which the protocol is attached or incorporated approaches extension of time for example and whether that would be sufficient to cover delay in providing the information required by the information particulars finally in terms of these general obligations the security obligations in QS 4.8 clause 4.8 are much more simplified than those in the CIC protocol second edition essentially it's just an obligation to comply with the security management plan may will comment later or we will comment later anyway on the security implications under the information protocol and in particularly some of the remedies that arise for failure to comply with the security management plan so another key information management obligation in the information protocol is an obligation in relation to what's called the prepared documents and the prepared documents include the management documents workflows and resources required under ISO 19650 as essentially are set out in the information particulars So to simplify these obligations, essentially the appointee prepares those documents to the extent required by ISO 19650 or the underlying appoint appointment and assists um, with updates to those documents. Otherwise, if the appointee isn't, isn't required to prepare them, they've got to at least have some role in assisting those documents be prepared and that's intended to create real collaboration across the project team in terms of how these documents are pulled together and encourage consistency the information protocol states that the prepared documents as at the date of the appointment are those documents set out in the information particulars but as i said the protocol does have flexibility to allow those documents to change during the life of the protocol. So it doesn't necessarily fix you to those documents. But it is important that both parties are involved with updating those, those documents and updating the information particulars as necessary during the project. Now, the final part of my, my section is in relation to information delivery plans. And these are the key plans that set out the time scale at which information is required to be provided by particular task teams. The obligation to set out in clauses 4.12 to 4.14 and really relate to the task information delivery plan and the obligations are for that plan to be established by task teams under each party's control to be complied with by those parties and to be reviewed and updated and really those obligations they're consistent with the obligations i was just describing in relation to the prepared documents and it acknowledges that you need to have these documents in place and they should be reviewed on an ongoing basis and complied with again the rights following any update of the task information delivery plan 
are to be assessed in accordance with the appointment. So again, it's important that the protocol and is considered alongside the appointment and any rights that might arise following an update are discussed. The final obligation in relation to the task information delivery plan is for each party to ensure that the information that's produced by the task teams is reviewed and that reflects the provisions of the ISO. It is important that the extent to which these obligations are appropriate should be considered under each particular appointment. But if the task information delivery plan is a key part of the information management delivery deliverables, it will be important that it's contractually binding and the definition of the term is flexible because it essentially um, only applies to the extent it's applicable to the, to the relevant party or any task team. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so, sorry. Uh, so, the next thing um, we're going to go through is a CD workflow and solutions. Now, this is building upon the existing uh, clauses within the CIC BIM protocol about the electronic data. However, as I'm sure all of you will know, the ISO increases the provisions about the CD quite substantially uh, and has very specific obligations on the various parties. So where those require some contractual clout, we've included them in the protocol. So for example, the appointing party being responsible for establishing and implementing the CD, uh, storage and archiving of the information, things which are really important to get right. Uh, Obviously, this is a template, and this is just limiting uh, us to what the ISO requires. You may have a particular project requirements. Uh, your organization may do things a different way. For example, if you have a separate CD for your supply chain, all you need to do is add a clause which uh, establishes how that is set up, who is responsible for what. You'll find that uh, hopefully the protocol is drafted in a way it's relatively easy to add on clauses which cater for your specific circumstance. Uh, what we've also done is um, tweak some things in the existing protocol to make them work hopefully a bit better where there's been misunderstanding. So the exclusion of liability for corruption, unintended amendment, etc., is now mutual. Previously, it was only the project team which benefited from it. But it see, given the amount of information being exchanged, it seems sensible for the employer to also have the same exclusion. So it's now now works both ways. Uh, we also have applied the lessons learned from the Trant and Mont McDonald case. So parties now have an express right to access the information and the CD workflow and solutions, uh, both during the course of their time they're providing service, services, but also for the duration they're liable under their appointment. So this could be six or 12 years, obviously assuming that the CD is up for that long. Now, this is very important because as we uh, found in Trant and Mont McDonald, a uh, inability to access information can have quite a lot of consequences from for project. Or if you get a claim two years after project's finished, you may not be able to respond to it because you simply don't have all the information. The um, next one is a new clause. Uh, management of information to again reflect the additional requirements introduced by the ISO. So things like having obligations to carry out certain information management functions and tasks which the ISO requires and compliance with uh, documentation like the information standard, the uh, production methods and procedures. Things which were not really um, the same requirements in the PAS 1192. 
We also um, recognize the fact that in the ISO, there is a, uh, there are various provisions which allow for the fact parties may obviously appoint third parties to carry out some of their tasks. But I'm sure we all know from experience when people uh, outsource, there can be gaps in what they um, require the party to do. There may, what they're asked to do may not be um, sufficiently comprehensive. So, so there's a gap in obligations and liability. To highlight this and hopefully avoid that sort of unnecessary dispute, we point out that if you are appointing third parties, then do include sufficient scope to describe the role and responsibilities. Make it clear what they're supposed to be doing. Now, you may say, well, why should you have to do that? People should be doing that anyway. But it's better for things to be clear because I can tell you from experience, the things you will have disputes about are the things you don't say. Uh, they are not the things which are very clear in the documentation. The other uh, new clause is about level of information need, obviously not pronounced loin. Uh, now, level of information need is very important uh, part of the ISO, as I'm sure we all know. However, it is possible parties, particularly clients who are new to the ISO, won't realize this, won't really understand that they should be um, producing one uh, or agreeing one with the parties. So again, we have put a positive obligation saying, you, this is something important, this is something you do need to do, and suggested either it should be set out in the information particulars, so uh, in the EIR or other documentation, or to be agreed after the event if, for example, the client didn't get round to it. Now, there isn't a formal um, definition for level of information need, although there is one being produced by in Europe currently. So for the purposes of contractual certainty, we've explained what level of information need means for the purposes of legal contract, for purposes of the protocol. And I, I appreciate it's, it's a bit of a mouthful, but in effect, we are saying it's what is needed for the information, what level is needed, and how is that to be measured? So where you have a contractual deliverable information, what level of information does the client want? And how are you going to know you've got there? And th that is fundamentally uh, what level of information need requires from uh, looking at it from a contractual rather than a technical perspective. And this will hopefully enable parties to agree to that. Okay, which brings us on to Clause 8, <clears throat> Use of Information. Uh, now, this is uh, a provision that uh, will be familiar with those that know the CIC BIM protocol. Um, it's based fairly closely on that uh, provision, uh, and it deals essentially with GDPR and data protection, and most importantly, uh, intellectual property issues. Uh, there is an intellectual property issue floating in as we speak. Um, the um, you could probably divide it up. Uh, it's a fairly lengthy clause. You could probably divide it up into sections dealing with various bits. The first one is quite a short clause, 8.1, which um, states that the parties are to observe their um, GDPR obligations, um, and that, um, uh, as is common with most or many clauses in the protocol, if it's already in the appointment, then the protocol will defer to what's in the appointment. Uh, if not, then there is a statement of what the parties need to do. Um, I mean, somebody has raised the issue um, with us about why, why bother saying this, because they're required to do it anyway. But this is the point that I think both Andrew and May have made about the need for clarity uh, and making sure that we do state uh, very clearly what the party's obligations are, even if that might be uh, the case anyway, uh, setting out a comprehensive list of um, points that are important contractually and legally um, is always the best way to ensure as far as you can that there is clarity between the parties about what they're required to do. In this particular clause, um, the definitions of GDPR and data protection laws are set out uh, in Clause 13, 
that Andrew has already mentioned, the uh, definition section. Uh, and the clause itself is short and it's basically intended to be flexible to cover what is still a fairly um, quickly developing uh, area of law. Now, the, um, the bulk of the rest of uh, Clause 8, which is a fairly lengthy clause, as I say, is to do with um, uh, essentially defining the use to which intellectual property is uh, put in the context of uh, information management. And it is broadly that the material is only to be used for the permitted purpose. Both of these uh, terms are defined in Clause 13, uh, and the clause reflects the uh, general structuring of uh, the way that uh, IP is handled uh, in this context, which is, as I say, is, is much the same as it was in the CIC BIM protocol, which is um, a license-based system whereby the owner of um, the rights in the relevant intellectual property grants a license to the, the person wishing to use it, which is limited to its use in the context of the project or the permitted purpose. So uh, again, um, the way that it's broadly set out is clause 8.2 um, states the general position again that if there are provisions in the appointment, uh, which cover this area in relation to copyright, moral rights, rights in design, database rights, and so on, then um, the appointment takes precedence. Uh, the only possible uh, adjustment might be to um, uh, ensure that the provisions in the appointment apply to the material prepared um, and also to enable the appointor uh, under the appointment to grant the appropriate licenses. If, however, there aren't any such provisions, then the clause sets out a framework uh, in two groups, if you like, um, uh, at dealing with the rights that would need to be granted uh, via the licenses. And clauses 8.3 to 8.5 very broadly set out the um, appointees' rights to grant licenses uh, and sub-licenses uh, and also define what would be in that license. Uh, and then um, the uh, 8.5 basically um, tells you what you cannot include in that license, which is essentially a right to uh, amend or modify any uh, intellectual property um, that is the subject of that license, um, not for the permitted purpose or not to reproduce any designs or other information um, for an extension to the works. So in other words, this is ring fencing the rights that you can um, grant a license in respect of and always circling back to that um, key uh, provision of using material only for the permitted purpose. Now, 8.6 and 8.8 .8 are basically equivalent obligations going the other way to the extent that the appointor needs to grant the appointee a license to use intellectual property um, to enable the appointee to carry out its obligations. I mean, very broadly, as we know, uh, information flows up towards the appointor or uh, appointing party. Uh, and uh, there may be circumstances in which um, the uh, appointee needs uh, access to material which the appointor alone or third parties can grant so that uh, 86288 deals with um, that uh, occurrence. Uh, sorry, skipped ahead there. Uh, there are two uh, final provisions not mentioned in the slide, um, which are clauses 8, 9, and 8, 10, uh, which again are statements clarifying the legal obligations in relation to the rights to do what you say you're going to do in the rest of the clause. So the appointee confirms that they do have the right to grant the licenses that they are granting, um, and the appointor represents the same thing the other way. So you can see, if you want to break down Clause 8 in terms of its structure, um, an initial clause uh, in relation to GDPR rights, and then a framework 
for the granting of rights to use intellectual property um, without ever actually passing the ownership uh, of that intellectual property onto the other party uh, as between the appointor and the appointee um, purely for the permitted purpose which is of course the the subject of the appointment itself so moving on from there um, the next clause uh, again dealing with information and what you do with it is clause nine it's a much shorter clause and it contains um, a number of uh, obligations covering various matters um, <clears throat> the first two uh, nine one and nine two uh, are basically what what you might again regard as statements of the obvious but uh, as we said actually um, stating the obvious in a contractual document um, is useful because it is it sets up clarity for the parties to understand what it is um, that they are entering into. So the statements of the obvious in uh, 9.1 and 9.2 are that the appointee is responsible for, for delivering the information required by the information particulars for which the appointee is responsible. So the appointee does what it's responsible for doing in relation to information and the appointor is responsible for assisting the appointee in that task by delivering information which the appointor may have. Clause 9.3 um, requires a, a risk assessment to be undertaken by the lead appointed party when establishing the work's information. Uh, again, uh, a useful uh, uh, a re requirement on the lead appointed party and worth stating even if it might be undertaken anyway. And finally, clause 4 is a useful provision where the um, appointee is to um, provide information to assist the appointor to capture lessons learned in respect of the works during the performance of the appointee's obligations under the appointment. So again a, a handy provision hopefully to make sure that um, the lessons learned from the various um, uh, from the from the project are not forgotten clause sorry clause 10 um, liability limitation of liability provision uh, a short provision but um, uh, essentially saying that neither party has liability to the other if the other party modifies or amends um, in any way the information model and material and so on for any purpose other than the permitted purpose. So this goes back to the permitted purpose referred to uh, in clause eight. Uh, I thought perhaps um, uh, a useful way to look at this might be to turn it round and to say in other words, if I issue information to you, um, I'm only liable to you if there is something um, wrong with that information, if you're using it for the permitted purpose. If you uh, do something else with it um, and something uh, occurs as a result of the misuse of that information, I am not liable. So this clause ties in, um, as I say, with clause eight really in terms of um, restricting uh, the use of the material, the information, only to the permitted purpose. And if you don't do so, then the person issuing it is not liable to you for use of that information. And the final clause for me to look at uh, is um, clause 11, which um, is uh, about remedies in relation to security. And you'll recall um, Andrew was referring earlier back at clause 4.8 to the obligation to comply with the security management plan if a security management plan is required uh, that again is defined in clause 13 uh, it should be identified in the information particulars at the front of the protocol if you're going to use it um, the um, terminology reflects the provisions of the forthcoming iso 19650 part five which is being issued on the 9th of july so it's up to date with that um, uh, forthcoming iso and essentially um, what clause 11 does is to say that if um, there is a requirement to have a security management plan and the appointee um, breaches 
um, the requirements of the security management plan uh, and either that breach is not capable of remedy or it isn't remedied after a reasonable period of time then the appointee in, can terminate uh, the appointment for breach of the security provisions that's broadly it in a nutshell uh, so again designed to you may not have to use it because you may not need uh, to uh, have a security management plan but obviously um, look at 19655 when it comes out because that does require people to consider whether or not they should be um, putting these in place um, and um, that requires what's called a triage to assess whether one is needed or not so I'll hand over now back to me thank you um, thanks Simon uh, so what's next implementation well one of the things that is a obstacle or, or one thing to get over is that the legal community is still on their BIM journey, they are still trying to understand all the different processes, what documents, what standards are out there. So you may need to tell them that there is the ISO 19650, what it is, um, the protocol exists, uh, provide them with a copy potentially, help help your uh, legal advisors to help you. Uh, the other uh, potential issue is that I uh, would suggest and we would suggest people are still not perhaps taking the legal and contractual issues of BIM as seriously as they should. Uh, it is often considered that um, the legal community is kind of getting in the way of business, but if you do have a dispute, it will obviously take you a lot more time and money than getting the contract clear in the first place. And our aim, having all of us have been involved in the legal side of BIM for many years, and our aim is to make your life as simple as possible. We hopefully have, we've listened to people and what you need um, over time and trying to have a workable document that uh, functions both for your lawyers but also for you and having said all that the next steps are really to read the protocol uh, ask us questions unlike most uh, standard form documents out there there is the big advantage that you know us you have our contact details feel free to uh, send us emails send us um, Twitter messages and just ask the questions if you don't understand anything and use the protocol tell everyone else to use it because if everyone's using the same thing and there's a standardized way of doing things necessarily the risk and the uncertainty reduces because you're all on the same page and obviously if you do use it complete the information particulars with the comfort of knowing you aren't going to miss out any blanks within the documentation which you should have filled in. Because ultimately, the information protocol should be included in all contracts which are implementing the ISO 19650. And obviously, the form of contract impacts how it should be included. So uh, if you're using the NEC, the NEC is currently writing some guidance on how you should implement the information protocol into the documents because obviously they don't have schedules. The JCT practice note, which we wrote last year, already um, envisaged this protocol coming out. So you can use that practice note to inform how you implement this protocol into JCT documentation. Now, I understand that and appreciate that when you read the protocol, you may have some uh, concern that it still has some legalese in it, uh, still has legal wording, because unfortunately, ultimately, it is a legal and contractual document. There are certain things you need to do, certain things you need to phrase to make things legally binding or to make them clear from a contractual perspective, from a case law perspective. However, using our experience of BIM and um, our construction law experience, we've tried to minimize the legalese and make it as clear as possible, um, but also, again, working for both the lawyers and the industry. Uh, and obviously, uh, I, we do have time for some questions, but if we don't get to your questions uh, and you want to ask something that wasn't raised and isn't published in the later Q&A, don't hesitate to contact us. 
uh, do, as I said, encourage your legal advisors to get in touch with BIM for Legal because the more knowledge they have, the better they're going to be able to advise you. Thank you very much. Thank you, May. Thank you, Simon and Andrew and Andy. Um, so we have had quite a few um, questions come through. So I'm just going to see if I can actually move the slides on, but I can't. So that's fine. So let's start with um, the first one. Uh, May, Andrew, Simon, Andy, when you answer them, can you keep the answers quite short? Because we've got quite a few to get through. So first off, can you confirm the master information delivery plans and the task information delivery plans are now considered contract documents? Yes, they're referred to within the protocol. So they're not um, attached to it, but they are referred to, you'll find them in the list of information particulars. So they are they are contract, um, they, they are binding, they're contractually binding. Okay, uh, thank you for that one. Um... Okay, are there any plans to produce guidance checklist document that, con that contract drafters could use if rather than using the protocol adding, they integrate the terms into the front end of a document? This integrated approach may lead to BIM being more central to the contract administration rather than an annex to it. So, yeah, so are we looking for to produce a document that could be used into the front? of the contract. Anyone? Simon, would you like to take that one? Uh, yeah, um, I think um, I think we're not. Um, uh, I mean, it's obviously uh, that one of the, re the purposes of the protocol as it is, is to gather together all, the, all of the relevant bits of information that um, we think that parties will need to set up the contractual um, legal framework in relation to um, the use of information management and BIM. Uh, I think it, it is possible to spread it out throughout the contract, but that would end up with a, a document that would be a series of additions and amendments and uh, to uh, the contract that would depend on, would vary depending on what the contract was. So for example, look, would look very different as between the JCT and the um, NEC um, and might be quite unwieldy. The point about the putting it into a protocol is you can insert the thing into the contract, um, probably quite high up in the contractual hierarchy, and it's all there. And all you need to do is to fill in the front page, and you've done it all. Uh, if you have a series of, of additions going into the contract, then you also run the risk you might miss something, or you know, and so on and so forth. So it's tended to be as efficient as possible. So I think probably the short answer to that is probably we weren't thinking of doing that. Okay, thank you. Um, a statement as opposed to a question, but um, the current protocol doesn't work for pass down to the various parties in its current format as each need to create and define separately for each party. Anybody want to come back on that one? Uh, I, I would respectfully disagree because this is the protocol the CIC BIM protocol was drafted essentially for tier one um, but this protocol was it has been drafted specifically to apply to every tier including supply chain uh, and hence the expressions a bit of tongue twisters that Andrew went through um, and we went uh, we spent some months trying endeavouring to get that right so that you can insert it, say, if it's a sub-consultant or if you're a domain contractor. Okay. Um, why does the terminology not fully match the ISO, particularly the information particulars which don't match ISO clauses 5.4.6 and 5.4.7? Very specific there. Andrew, did you want to explain uh, yeah, that? I, 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 I can take that. Me? Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I think on the first part, um, the terminology isn't exactly the same as the ISO because we're defining it in the protocol. It defines terms that are specifically applicable to each particular appointment. 
um, the ISO by its nature of being a standard which is generic and intended to apply um, to a various number of um, projects and contractual arrangements, um, it's not specific and it doesn't create that contractual certainty just to use the exact same definitions all the time. And so um, that, that approach would, um, would yeah, cause some ambiguity if we had done that. Um, so I think just, in terms sorry, of the specific, Andy. yeah, in terms of the specific point about the clauses in the ISO, I probably want to consider that offline and just remind myself what those of provisions of the of the ISO say. Um, it may be that we've, <clears throat> I think the ISO is is, um, it's not doesn't prescribe exactly what you need to put in in an appointment um, to reflect ISO, it, it's got some suggestions in there, um, although there are, there are some things that should be in every appointment, um, and it, it may be the protocol to, to, to embed the information management process in the ISO. In the ISO. Um, it includes further or additional documents to, to those that are um, specifically identified in the, in the ISO. But that's just to embed everything in, in, in the contractual approach. Okay, so a couple of other comments around the terminology. Um, terminology of mixing and matching appointee, appointer, appointing party, lead appointed party and appointed parties across the document is very confusing and could have been avoided by splitting the protocol into sections. The ISO is very clear on who does what but this person feels that there's more confusion in the protocol. So, uh, so one of the things we um, we did this, the protocol you see went through hundreds of iterations. Uh, the obviously the terms appointing party, lead appointed party, these are all terms in the ISO and have to be used. Uh, there are certain requirements which contractually we would want the person who is the um, the client as it were as within the relationship and the person who is being appointed certain things they have to do which are unrelated to the ISO uh, and so it's not just all the things that the appointed party is doing all the things the lead appointed party all the things that the appointed party are doing and so the way we've tried to do it is whoever's doing the appointing as between in the in the protocol and who is whoever's delivering the services they know what they have to do and are there any additional obligations that they have because they are also the lead appointed party or appointing party we i mean we do sympathize that it is it the the terminology but in from from a sort of documentation perspective it it this was the best we could um, find in terms of clarification. Simon and Andrew, did you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I mean, just um, uh, we the terminology had to be neutral so it could be used in a number of circumstances. It had to mirror the ISO terminology, which obviously is international. So you couldn't you couldn't go back to employer and contractor and so on. Um, and also, we did, I think, at one point, memory has it, a, a experiment with. Um, basically s splitting out clauses and saying the same thing over and over again with the different parties in as it were appointed party or lead appointed party or appointing party and so on which made it even more unwieldy than some might think it is now and I think this this represents a sort of the best that we could get to using terms that are very unfamiliar um, uh, and and probably will be easier to understand once as it were you apply them specifically to a particular contract in in the supply chain or in the in the project, where you can then you can then, as it were, substitute the names A and B or X and Y for um, the appointer and appointee. I hope. Okay. Um, another question: If the BEP and the IDPs are contract contractual documents, then every change to these plans will require extensive change management. If there are multiple LAPs, as is suggested in the guidance, how are the multiple 
MIDPs, EIRs and PIS coordinated and integrated between delivery teams. As I, uh, sorry, May, uh, as ITA 19650 part two does not appear to have any requirements for this coordination. Okay, can I jump in there? Yeah, go for it. Um, yes, yeah, so that, and it's, it's, a, it's a very good question and the guidance that's coming on the information management function does look at that scenario. Um, I'd say in simplest terms, you're right, each lead appointed party needs to reduce those resources. Um, and there is an element of coordination, especially if those lead appointed parties are going to work closely together. For example, a client appointed design team, each one of those is, is effectively a lead appointed party and needs to respond separately, but they need to work collaboratively to iron out any potential conflicts or um, issues with it with their responses so yeah I'd, I'd signpost you to the upcoming guidance um but go for it if there's anything legally specific on that guys just to jump in there um just just one thing i would point out is that uh there's been long-running controversy as to whether the bep should be a contractual document uh and i have always from a legal perspective i've always advocated that it should because if it's not contractual you don't have to comply with it i have represented people in various disputes where um the bet isn't a contractual document and their supply chain wake up one day and says well i'm not going to comply with it unless you pay me an extra ten thousand pounds or whatever it is uh, there are ways there are contractual ways of allowing for the fact that a bet is an incomplete document when you enter into the contract obviously uh but what amounts to a change uh whether it will be uh whether it, it falls within the general uh right to additional time and cost within the contract and the protocol makes allowance for that so you're not automatically entitled but it will be considered in the normal way as anything else uh if your if your scope gets varied for example thank you do you think we will move towards multilateral appointments to ensure changes arising from BIM data are properly passed around the project task delivery teams? I can I can take this, and I and I guess um, that there has definitely been an industry shift towards, um, I guess, multilateral or, or um, what I would call multi-party appointments through the use of um, different procurement or, or collaborative procurement methods such as alliancing and partnering and BIM and information management processes under ISO very much sit hand in hand with that approach but I, I do think it, it's just going to be something that um, it needs to be considered on a project by project basis whether that's the that's the right approach and, and it's generally at the moment that the sort of alliancing or, or partnering approach is more often used in your larger frameworks or your your higher profile um, infrastructure project, for example. Okay, a couple of points around the risk register. Um, the risk register is not a document included in ISO 19650, I think that's what I say, uh, 5.4.6 and not deliverable as part of the contract and somebody else has made a point of saying is the protocol risk register does it sit in parallel with other risk registers and does it allocate risk in any specific way well that will be a matter for the parties uh what the the protocol is obviously a template document and like the iso it it will it's has to be drafted in a relatively neutral way to apply to all projects. If you, where, how you draft your risk register will depend on your particular situation. You may have just one risk register for the project, so uh, there isn't a separate risk register as such, or conversely, you may have a separate BIM one. I've seen it done both ways successfully. Uh, and no one size fits all. I would suggest we're just giving, we're giving you the tools to work out what, works best for you I'd, I'd just add to that as well that the the risk register is is a requirement for a, a lead appointed party as part of their tender response that is one of the resources that's required according to the iso 
Okay, can you please explain how info management roles were additional roles? This was never the case. It was ensuring clearly defined responsibilities were in place with defined roles. Who wants to take that one? Um, I can have a go. Um, for, for, from my perspective, um, I think this relates to the fact that the, the information protocol doesn't refer to an information manager or information management role or the built asset security management role. And I think that the, the fact that those roles aren't specifically referred to is just a consequence of the approach in the standards. We're not saying that those roles are no longer required. We're just saying we, we don't think you need to call them out specifically contractually because they're roles that should be embodied as part of the other roles um, that are being um, carried out by the appointed parties on the project. Okay. Yeah, if I can just sorry, just yeah. add to that the the one of the changes that 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 I think we will see when um, ISO 19650 Part Five comes out. So this is really reference to the built the built asset security manager, is that the responsibility for um, deciding what to do in relation to security minded issues go, goes up the line to the employer and, and relates to the employer's governance. So the employer can choose. Um, uh, as to whether they um, or a, a point lead appointing party in this case can choose as to whether they they carry out um, this function themselves or somebody does rather than necessarily having a specific person appointed just to do that role. It may be somebody doing a multiple role. Uh, so that sort of slight change in emphasis is one of the things that that is different in the um, in ISO 19650 part five and, and this I think recognizes that change. Okay if we only have reasonable skill and care uh, and in brackets required standard how does this reflect that for example a task information delivery plan is an outcome not an input. So how does it reflect that we only have reasonable skill and care? Reasonable skill and care um, is how you're performing your service, so how you're, you're you're doing something up to reasonable skill and care. So you're not promising a certain outcome. Uh, if you are obliged to say TIDP, you are obliged to prepare it. You're not say uh, using the the um, example given in the question. You're not promising it will enable you to to build a 10 story building it, you're you're not you're not warranting certain things you're you're doing you're preparing it with reasonable skill and care i yeah, hope that I, answers the question yeah and i mean if i can just jump in in terms of the the, the definition of required standard it doesn't use the term reasonable reasonable in it um it just ties it in with the skill and care that's required under the appointment so the protocol doesn't say that all the obligations are tied to reasonable skin and care it's just saying that they're made consistent with the skin and care that's applicable under the appointment so it's opening it up for parties to say in the appointment okay we want it to be reasonable skin and care or they might want something to be a more a higher standard than that uh, one thing I would also point out is that there is very uh, complicated case law regarding when it's reasonable skill and care and when it's a strict obligation that happened last year or the year before, uh, which your lawyers will be aware of, and whether something you have to comply with it strictly or whether you're bound by um, a certain uh, the reasonable skill and care in your appointment um, is is sort of legally complicated. Um, so, so that's a question, so one to take to your lawyers if um, if you need further advice on it, I'd say. Okay. One of the fundamental principles of BEMA's ISO 19650 is collaborative working. True collaborative working requires mutual understanding and trust and a deeper level of standardised process that, than has typically been experienced. Is this good faith relationship able to to be pursued in the protocol? If so, how? 
your bear in mind a protocol is just the legal bits of your BIM processes. Your actual procedures, your collaborative parts will both be in your requirements and your bet. That doesn't change. Uh, the fact you um, how you how you're collaborating and or indeed if you're the client how you want people to collaborate needs to be built in this the protocol um, does build in where as much as we can obliging people to be collaborative but the real uh, meat on the bones will be in the other documentation and will be obviously how you collaborate is very person specific and project specific okay yeah, sorry, could just add that we did contemplate at one point whether we would um, put a, a, a more um, uh, a provision uh, requiring or setting out a dispute resolution process if there were any disagreements about how aspects of this worked and we decided not to. Uh, and the relevant provision, uh, I forget where it is, towards the front of the protocol basically says you, you just need to sort this out collaboratively. That was That was the idea. And so really the sort of rights for termination, I think, really only come up in the context of Clause 11 that I was talking about, which is to do with security. But the idea is that the, the parties do work together to resolve any issues that they have in the protocol rather than going down a dispute resolution mechanism. Okay, well, we have come to the end of the webinar, but what we will do, because I heard there are a lot of questions and I'd like to get a few through a few more. We'll carry on for another 10 minutes or so. And as previously mentioned, if we don't get to answer your question, we will do this offline and share it via the, the web page as well. Um, so there's a number of questions here. Um, most contracts include GDPR and copyright. Are there likely to be conflicts and what clauses need to, need to be amended in the NEC or JCT contracts? The protocol has an order of precedence clause, which um, we're not looking for the protocol to uh, replace the um, other terms agreed between the parties. So if you have a GDPR clause in your appointment, uh, and you may not, uh, then um, that would take precedence. But we are trying to be completely careful and deal with all possible scenarios. Okay, how does clause eight equivalent obligations on the appointer differ from those responsibilities under the CDM regulations? Uh, well, um, clause eight deals with intellectual property rights and GDPR and data. Uh, CDM regulations more about sort of uh, uh, health and safety uh, and I and appreciate there's information, as it were, the handling and management of information applies in, in both of those scenarios. Um, clause 8 is not intended to deal with CDM obligations um, uh, at all, I think. Um, the intellectual property in relation to um, what's, being, uh, what's being dealt with in Clause 8 is, is um, uh, defined as material. Uh, that's what you're dealing with. The material is defined in clause 13, um, uh, specifically in relation to um, the outputs that are related to the um, information model and the project itself, rather than the health and safety issues. Okay. Can an appointer change the permitted use to include for the appointer to use the information for other uses? For example, space planning on a future project on a similar design. Uh, shall I start on that one? Um, I think um, I mean, it's up to the parties to decide what they want to do um, in relation to the precise um, uh, ambit of the licenses. Uh, and um, as May has said, you know, with the, and this is a sort of general approach throughout most of the protocol, if it's in the appointment, then that's fine. Um, if it isn't, then this is what you can do. Um, and Clause 8 certainly follows that um, approach um, and uh, generally follows the, the idea that you can only use the material for the permitted purpose um, uh, as defined. Um, and um, in fact, Clause 8.5 8, um, uh, 
does put restrictions on the license that that is granted in relation to modification and reproduction for other purposes but um this is this is not to say that the parties can't agree to do something different so so they can if they wish okay most contracts will have clauses for remedies and termination who should these be amended by to avoid conflict I can have a go at this one. Um, it's really about considering any conflict there might be between the, the termination rights in relation to security um, and the termination position in the underlying appointment. And that that's something that, yeah, really should be something that the legal advisors, whether that's your in-house team or external lawyers, um, should have have a look at, but it but it should be fairly a straightforward task just to have a, have a look at in the first instance to see if there is a a potential conflict there. Okay. Does the lack of wider supply chain capability result in a lead appointed party never wanting to be responsible for any potential failure to deliver BIM? Andy, would you like to take that one? Uh, I don't think it's a legal question, really. Question. I do apologise. Repeat the question. So the question is, does the lack of wider supply chain capability result in a lead appointed party never wanting to be responsible for any potential failure to deliver BIM? Um, potentially, but I suppose that's what, what the risk register would be for. And, and and if you're maintaining that, you know, if there are any concerns about capabilities of various supply chain members, you'd, you'd can, can, you know, update that risk register and make it available and then would have to address any potential issues there. Don't know if that answers the question. That would be my take. Uh, okay. What are works information requirements? Somebody's asked that. Um, does he link to the NEC ECC3 works information? Should we take that one offline? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah I'm not, yeah. not completely sure how that fits in with the protocol. I think that that relates more to the NEC specifically. Yeah. And I'd say what I suggest is wait for the guidance to come out. Um, I understand it will be coming out soon and they will explain how the protocol should will interrelate with all the NEC bits of document. Okay, a TIDP is your best guess of deliverables at the start of a project. There may be items on there that end up not being needed or relevant as the pro project progresses. If TIDP is now contractual, could you be held to deliver something listed even if it isn't needed or relevant as merely a tick box exercise by your appointing party? This could mean TIDPs moving forward become a lot more generic, gen generic and less useful as a result. Comments, please. And my, my, my response would be no, no, because the, as I mentioned, the, the definitions in the protocol um, of the key documents and processes that refer to those documents as may be updated from time to time. So, as long as you've updated the TIDP in accordance with the ISO, or, or um, then you shouldn't be held to the original version of that document. Um, and also, um, to some extent, it sounds like the original document is a bit of a um, a catch-all um, document trying to cover everything, rather than specifically being tailored to the appointment. So, all that that approach is encouraging is that you in your TIDP, it does include what you're specifically providing under each appointment. Okay, thank you. One final question, uh, and Andy, this one is for you. Referring to the UK BIM framework, how does that fit with an international ISO? Okay, so obviously the main body of the, the uh, 19650 is, like you said, international. It's, it's the same for whichever region or country the specific UK piece is the, uh, the the forward and the national annex 
Um, so that that provides the UK specific um, clauses that we should be following in relation to things like naming convention, classification system. So an extension of some of the clauses in the in the main ISO. If that Brilliant. makes sense. Yep. Yeah. So what we will do, thank you, Andy, May, Simon and Andrew. Um, what we will do is take these questions, answer them offline and make them available on both the UK BIM Alliance London web page as well as the BIM for Legal web page. So you have access to all of those questions. Um, the recording will be made available via the UK BIM Alliance YouTube site. And the slides will also be shared via the BIM for Legal web page and the UK BIMA London web page. Um, you can see here that there's a, a quick slide to show you how you can get involved if you wish to get involved a lot more. Um, the contact details for May, Simon and Andrew will also be shared so you can talk to them directly. But for now, I want to thank you all for attending. Thank you for making it uh, as interactive as it can possibly be. Um, and thank you, Andy, May, Simon and Andrew for, for taking part. Have a good evening, everyone. Thanks.